nearly 1,000 bone-breaking lonely miles across Alaska. The Iditarod isn't a race, it's a test. At the point, my dog team didn't want to go, and uh, there was no way that I was going to make those dogs do that. How far are you willing to push yourself and your team? You know, I was having a hard time breathing. As I stood there as dogs struggled in pain with broken limbs. He's one six hundred. I hope they can forgive me. I didn't mean it. And as the finish line approaches, will it bring broken records or broken dreams? This is the 2016 Iditarod. A race of quiet moments. A race of tough choices. That's a pretty powerful force. There was no way that I was going to make those dogs do that. You're a champion, buddy. And sometimes heartbreak. Momentarily, it crossed my mind to call for help by pushing my button. But I realized there was not going to be any help at all. On this trail, records fall. For others, the best built plans come tumbling down. I don't know how I can possibly make it right for Jeff and Allie. But... I hope they can forgive me. I didn't mean it. And nothing is promised, not even snow. Iditarod 44. A year earlier, the Iditarod starting line was moved from Willow, 220 miles north to Fairbanks, in search of snowpack trail. In 2016, race officials feared it would happen again. Backup snow was hauled by train from Fairbanks to Alaska's largest city, where mushers could greet fans and size up the competition. This is where the story of the Iditarod 2016 race begins. The team that we've prepared this year is the best we've ever done. <laughs> Among the 85 racers, several four-time Iditarod champions looking to stake their claim as the best ever. I'm glad that I've had the opportunity to mentor, but I am absolutely not done trying to get there first. I won't be just in the event this year. I will actually be in the race. So if anybody's counting me out, I like to say, when you go to Vegas, you always been on black or red. And longtime contenders hunting for a first win. I've got a lot of good dogs. I've got a little bit of talent, and the luck is uh, debatable up in the air until, you know, the next 10 days. We'll see what happens. Dallas CV is Dallas CV, though, and uh, he's obviously the, the man or the boy to beat. I mean, I'm twice his age almost. And for others, a search for something more. It's a very healing for me to be out on the trail with my dogs. Jan Steves lost her son and then her home just months before the start of the race. It was the worst summer of my life. Just that one sec. Days after Steve's 31-year-old son suffered a fatal heart attack. He's uh, short final for 07, landing big lake. She learned a wildfire was threatening her house in Willow <laughs> and her 48 sled dogs. I was just screeching, you know, thinking I've lost my son. Now I'm going to risk losing my dogs. The house was lost, but neighbors helped to save her team. She made it to the starting line, holding those memories close. I have God, my mother and my son. A day later, One, go. the race start is officially underway from Willow to Nome. And away goes Jan Steves, and I did a ride. 964 miles to go. For Steves, the trouble begins right away. Just hours into the race, Steves appears in Squintna with four broken ribs. By the time I got to Yentna, you know, I was having a hard time breathing and um, I got checked out by the vets. And if I try to do, take booties off, you know, I can barely breathe. Her collarbone broken and her lung punctured in a crash. The best that I can figure out is when I took a turn, I ran over it and immediately I just went, Slam. With the race barely underway, avoiding mishaps like this one is more important than being first. For now, 
Just ask laid-back Nicholas Petit from Girdwood, Alaska, surprised to find himself in the lead checking in at Rainy Pass. I leave the starting line with whatever I need to do, whatever I feel like doing, what the dogs feel like doing. So I didn't really have any expectation of being first in any place. Just like the start, no plan. We, we don't do plans. We don't do schedules. We just run dogs. One musher who does have a plan? Last year's winner, three-time champion, reality TV star, and the youngest ever to win the Iditarod. The number, Dallas Seavey. 16. Seavey arrived second, feeling sick, but happy with the trail. That trail is gonna get a lot worse as people go through it. It's uh, good right now though. It might hold up for 10 or 20 teams, maybe more. While most mushers agree CV is the one to beat, he is about to be challenged by a familiar face, but an unproven Iditarod contender. Three, two, one. Go! The 2016 Iditarod is underway. There goes Nicholas Petit on Iditarod 44. Preparation and determination are sometimes outmatched by a little bad luck. We broke right here, so then it's duct taped. Did lots of stuff out there. I hit John Baker's trailer too. Sorry. 20 minutes later, I was stopped on the side of the trail and he let me borrow his wrench, so I guess he wasn't that mad. Petit and Dallas CV lead the pack, checking in at the Riverside Village. Yeah, the no plan plan is the way to go. <laughs> Welcome to Nikolai. Thank you. Dallas's father, two-time Iditarod champion Mitch CV, is close behind. The people who are going to win and place high will be here, you know, relatively close together today. I'm not quite that old, I just looked at The pace and the weather are heating up. Maybe too fast. Maybe too fast. Been on the brake since we started, literally. I had to drop a dog because of the heat. I even pulled over and gave him a snow bath. My hair's got little frozen things in it at least. Fresh off his Yukon Quest win only weeks earlier, Hugh Neff has had a strange race from the start. I had a kid careen down a hill through my dog team leaving Wasilla while all the parents and everybody's laughing and I'm looking at them going, you know, this kid could die. Switch these two. Things are going more smoothly for former Quest champ Brett Sass of Eureka. What else do you need? Our vet book and booty. Vet book the sign. The sign. And booties right here. You are good to go, my friend. Sass's fans begin to notice. The musher who lives and trains alone in the Alaska wilderness continues to pass through the crowded checkpoints, camping alone with his team along the trail. A trail that from here joins the frozen Kuskokwim River onto McGrath. First to town. Welcome to McGrath. Thank you. How y'all doing? Good. 29 year old Dallas Seavey. <laughs> the elder Seavey is just nine minutes behind. But he doesn't stop. Stealing the lead from his son and perhaps toughest competitor. The Iditarod is shaping up as another CV duel to the finish line. But two thirds of the race remain as mushers sprint to Takatna, a cozy hillside checkpoint. Known for homemade pies, many mushers will choose to spend a mandatory 24-hour rest here. A little quality time for a musher and her huskies. Karen Hendrickson is just happy to be on the trail after sitting out the previous year. 
She is still recovering from a broken back in 2014 when an SUV hit her team during a training run along the highway. I mostly just play with them and, and connect with them and probably take some naps with them and just, you know, hang out with them because really that's why we do this. We like dogs. A bond that is about to be tested as an unexpected danger awaits. Two of the teams in top contention will face the unimaginable, a fatal attack along the famed Iditarod Trail. Day four into the 2016 Iditarod, mushers reach the halfway mark. It has been a quick and relatively calm race, but that's about to change. Hungry for his fifth win, Jeff King just took the lead. His prize, a five course meal awarded to the first racer to reach the Yukon River, complete with an after dinner mint of $3,500 cash. The 61-year-old champion is in a playful mood as Dallas Seavey, Brent Sass, Nicholas Petit, and Two Rivers musher Ali Zirkel round out the first five to reach the river. If I need to make up some time, I can do that. If I'm already in front or close enough, I can back off a little bit and build up a little more speed. Zirkel doesn't wait around. But so far, so good for Zirkel. Oh! first to the Galena checkpoint in good spirits. Was I the only one in a blizzard this morning? <laughs> and taking the trail's challenges in stride. It was entertaining. It was Alaska in a nutshell. There was a little bit of snow and wind. <laughs> we were traveling on glare ice with a little bit of snow on top of it. But the very next morning, Mushers and fans awake to learn one dog is dead, two more suffered injuries, and two of the race's popular mushers have come under attack. It was dark, but for the light of an oncoming snow machine, as Jeff King and Ali Zirkel approach New Lotto, that's where the unthinkable happened. About 10 miles out of New Lotto, a snow machine went by me at high speed. It was so uh, incredibly close to my sled and my team that was well lit with lights and reflectors that it felt very intentional. Several of my dogs were struck. I was not. I was sort of, couldn't believe what had happened for a minute as I stood there as dogs struggled in pain with broken limbs and <clears throat> the throes of death for one of them. The snow machine slammed into Jeff King's sled dogs and overturned Zirkel's sled, each traveling miles apart. Race officials reported that the snow machiner repeatedly attempted to harm Zirkel and her team. King's Huskies Banjo and Crosby were injured and being transported by air to Anchorage. I've been told one has a fractured leg, the other is in some kind of better but in shock and of an impact injury of some kind. But three-year-old Nash was killed. I tried to perform what triage first aid I could, figure out what was going on. <laughs> Momentarily it crossed my mind to call for help by pushing my button, but I realized that was not going to be any help at all. While King mourned the loss and searched for answers, a snow machiner was waking up in Nulato with a faint memory of the night before. A Channel 2 news crew found him at home. Uh, what happened in your own words? As soon as I woke up, I heard about it and I checked my snow go. And I called the VPO right off the bat and I told him it was me. I thought about running and hiding, but I'm not going to run from my problems anymore. I thought I'd just deal with it. Arnold Demosky said he had visited friends 16 miles away in Koyakuk and he'd been drinking. It's been a really big problem in my life. and. I hope I can overcome it some way. Allie basically said she was attacked by a snow machiner out on the river and that he uh, tried to run her down on at least four occasions. I don't know how I can possibly make it right for Jeff and Allie, but I hope they can forgive me. I didn't mean it. The news made headlines across the globe, shocking fans and fellow racers. Yeah, it's scary because dogs don't, they don't have a chance against machinery. 
And when somebody that's of an altered state gets machinery, We worked so hard to get here, and and then some crazy guy comes trying to attack your dogs. That's unheard of. I've never heard of that before. It's just crazy. It looked to be an act of reckless bravado, attempting to scare me or the dogs. That's how it felt. If what I heard was correct about him turning around and making more than one pass at Alley, then he's won six hundred. I'm not a bad person. I turned around because I was concerned, and I, I just had so much adrenaline, and it may seem like I was driving erratically, but it's just, my blood was pumped, and I felt really bad. I was just concerned. King couldn't save Nash but he could make sure that someone was held responsible. Part of the sew machine, upon impact, flew off the cowling, and I picked it up and carried it back in hopes of um, identifying who did this. Oh yeah, it was on top of his sled when he came in. Growing up in a checkpoint village, Demosky was a fan of the race. Jeff King, a childhood hero. Mm, junior high and high school, we always used to make signs for musher thing. I always used to make signs for Jeff King. Alaska State Troopers arrived moments after this interview to take Demosky into custody. You're Arnold Demosky? Yes. But the race to Nome would continue. Two top teams delayed and emotionally deflated. And a relative newcomer making his bid for a first Iditarod win. Day six, the Iditarod reaches the wind-blown Bering Sea coast, and memorials begin to appear. Meanwhile, Brent Sass, who raced ahead of the mayhem, is now in first place with Dallas Seavey on his heels. It was some of the best mushing I've ever had in my life the last four or five hours. For once, he'll rest in a checkpoint. I really want to get some information about the trail ahead and the coast. It's the, it's the biggest unfamiliar place for me on the trail. and. That's the one thing you lack when you blow through all the checkpoints is you don't really get any information. He'll quickly learn rival Dallas Seavey is only one hour behind, and his team is looking good. He's trying to get up the, up the coast as fast as possible. In a lot of ways, this is kind of the fun part of this. Jeff King arrives in Unalakleet in 14th place, with Nash's mother, Skeeter, leading the team. His goal is to stay focused. It's very nice to have uh, sympathy and support for uh, the accident that we had a couple days ago, but it doesn't come that easy to everyone, such as me, to um, keep talking about it. Allie Zirkel, normally talkative and full of cheer, can't yet bring herself to talk about the attack. I'm trying not to. I, I think I'll talk about that after the race because it's really that was really bad, and I'm trying to get out of that negativity right now. It's tragic for all involved. You know, everybody deals with things like this. Some people are angry, some people are, are hurt. Um, it, it was a really big hit for the race. But the race will go on. Here, teams refuel and prepare for the final push to Nome, now 261 miles away. A notoriously punishing coastline lies ahead. It's been really hard and fast the whole trail. Uh, it's a little breezy, huh? Every year we get to the coast, it feels like the race is really beginning. Already, there's talk of a broken record in the making. I, I am within minutes of where I am on a record run. Either they're going to dramatically break the record or there'll be some people who can't keep it up, one or the other. But that record, if it happens at all, won't fall easily. And the race leaders will switch places yet again. Two-time champ Mitch Seavey now in front. I only run dogs one way. I try not to grind them down too far. The younger Seavey arrives just 10 minutes behind, with Brent Sass falling to third place. I need to get a little bit of water. But it's Dallas who leaves first, seizing the lead, heading to White Mountain. Dad chases. My goal of sorts was to get here with a 20-minute lead. Um, so 
I'm not saying that we've won the race because we sure as heck haven't. Patience and a late race push have placed CV in position to win. 39 minutes now separate the two champions, each chasing a dream, not willing to give up without a fight. I'll give them nothing for free, including dogs or college education. Sass now trailing by almost two hours, seemingly losing ground, but gaining perspective. I've been doing it for 10 years and I learn something new every second. Here, racers must wait eight hours before making the final sprint to Nome. Nothing is a given, but the outcome more predictable. Unless there's a big earthquake, one of us is going to win, it looks like, which would be great for me. Today, there will be no earthquake, no shakeup. The weather is clear. And so is Dallas's path to victory. He reaches Front Street in Nome at 2.20 a.m. This is Reef's brother, Littermate, and his name's Tide. And Tide's, uh, Tide finished with me last year and did a little bit of leading, and this year he really stepped up. You know, he's coming into his prime. Becoming a four-time Iditarod champion, breaking his own record for fastest finish by almost two hours. Those are just numbers, man. We, we run dogs. And 45 minutes later, a family reunion under the famed Burled Arch. Good job, Mon. Ali Zirkel recovered to finish third. Her fifth straight finish in the top five. Every checkpoint I went through, people were so supportive, and I couldn't just be with myself. It turned out I was with everyone. <laughs> and as the CV family celebrates. Dallas is a believer. If it's out there to be achieved, it's, he just thinks it's already his. Usually it turns out to be right. Brent Sass has left White Mountain only to return. His dogs refuse to run. Hour after hour ticks by. The big huskies sleep and Sass stays put. When he finally arrives, he's dropped from third to 20th. A difference of $44,000 in prize money. That was the most embarrassing moment of my life, sitting out there in that checkpoint. My dog team didn't want to go. For Sass, the race, and his dreams of a first place finish in Mushing's most celebrated race were over. At least for this year, a hard lesson, but one that helps him prepare for the next one. As soon as I turned around after we went, you know, 30 yards and I looked back at 10 of my best friends and they're all just saying, I don't think we want to go anywhere, Dad. I think we just want to hang out here. That's a pretty powerful force. And uh, there was no way that I was going to make those dogs do that. For about a week each year, you're, you get to spotlight your team. You're a champion, buddy. You get to highlight them, you get to show them off to the world, and there's this great event. And then starting here in another week, we'll be back mushing dogs again and doing that until next year's I did a rod. Looking ahead to another collection of quiet moments and tough choices, the I did a rod is first and foremost a test of endurance, whether it ends in broken bones, broken dreams, or a broken record.